Welcome everyone to our virtual seminar series um, on network governance. Can we govern ourselves digitally? We are thrilled today to have Lynn Kiesling with us. Uh, Lynn is a visiting associate professor in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Most recently, she was a visiting associate professor of, of economics at Purdue University and the associate director of the Purdue University Research Center in economics. Prior to that, she was associate professor of instruction at, in the Department of Economics at Northwestern University, where she was also a faculty affiliate and director of the Electricity Policy Program and the Searle Center on Law, Regulation, and Economic Growth. She's a prolific author, and her publications include a book, Deregulation, Innovation, Mar and Market Liberalization, Electricity Regulation in a Continually Evolving Environment. Her specialization focuses on organization, industrial organization, regulatory policy, and market design in the electricity industry. And particularly, she examines the interaction of market design and innovation in the development of retail markets, products and services, and the economics of smart grid technologies, something she's going to talk about today. So before she starts on her presentation, I'd also like to introduce you to Eric Alston, who is moderating our discussion. I think many of you already know Eric quite well, but just in case, Eric Alston is a scholar in residence at the Finance Division and the Faculty Director of the Hernando de Soto Capital Markets Program in the LEED School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's also a research associate with the Comparative Constitutions Project. His research and teaching is centered in the fields of law and economics and institutional organizational analysis, which he applies to research questions in the development of economics of rights along frontiers and the design of imp and implementation of constitutions and questions of legal institutions, transitions more generally. So that introduction out of the way, Lynn, I wanna hand it over to you. Thank you so much for being with here, for being with us here today. We've been really looking forward to this all semester long. Oh, thanks, Jen. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I know we had talked about doing this in person last spring and I know we're all craving some in-person interaction, but uh, at least Zoom is better than, <laughs> better than nothing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, oh, I can't share my screen. Try again. All right. I've co-hosted you. Thank you. There we go. I promise I will not abuse will, my power. I can take that power away very quickly. <laughs> I will attempt not to abuse my power. Um, okay, uh, good. So is, is the, the slide showing up okay? Great. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to be here. I, and I have some specific questions for a governance, uh, a governance audience. So um, the work here today is uh, part of a, a longstanding collaboration I have with Dave Chasson, who's also here. And uh, as I said, we'll answer all of the difficult engineering and mathematical questions. Uh, Dave's at the SLAC uh, laboratory at Stanford. And we are interested in the intersection of economics, engineering, um, and computer science, really. That, and also, from the economics perspective, what are the governance institutions that we can use to enable markets for coordination in an electricity system that has traditionally been very top-down, very hierarchical, and very unidirectional. Uh, and so I'll dig into exactly what all of those things mean as I go on. The motivation for the work that we're doing is very much um, grounded in technological dynamism. And the idea that there's a lot of change going on right now in uh, distributed energy resources or DERs that are, um, you know, uh, rooftop solar is a good example, electric vehicles, battery storage. Um, so you could even call wind farm, a wind farm a DER. Uh, and the idea is that, that um, this technological changes going on, the DER innovation in combination with the underlying digitization, the, the digital transformation of our society, that those two technological um, 
trends are combining in energy to create an increasingly decentralized and diverse grid, which is not the way it's been historically. So if you look at the, the graphic that I, the schematic I've put here to illustrate the point, the red panel on the left is kind of the old one-way road of the electric system that, you know, from the 1880s onward, the um, electricity grid has been uh, designed and architected for large central scale generation of, of electricity and a big transmission network that pushes that current down into through transformers into a distribution network that then is how the end users get their power. And it's a very one way road. Um, it was built as an electromechanical network and uh, it was definitely built for large scale generation, large scale transmission and distribution, and that all of the folks around the edge of the network were just consumers, right? I flip the switch and the light goes on. Lynn, um, I think your slides aren't advancing. If you're talking about a diagram. Um, I am. Yeah, do you see do you see a, a slide that says research motivation and has a, a graphic on it? No, not on my end. All I'm seeing is your title slide. Um, um I, I yeah. maybe someone with this this is this is a problem in Zoom. I think someone in our audience may have experience with this. Well, Can I you know I have a message that says sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. But the problem is that if I do that it's going to mess up my full screen, right? <laughs> so, um, let's see. I think somebody, it has to do with sequencing or something. Yeah. I mean, what I, I, I can just leave it out of full screen, which will That's probably my, uh, somewhat uh, troglodytic fix as opposed to a technologically yeah. sophisticated one. There. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Then um, the panel on the right here is the one way, the old one way road from the large scale central generators to the end users. Um, what what DERs and digitization enable, though, is a lot more diversity, both in size and in location in within the distribution grid and here I'm just now I'm just going to talk about the distribution grid and so you can have all kinds of different resources and you can even have resources one of which I'm going to talk about in a second that can sometimes be producers and sometimes be consumers right in the old in the old kind of um, one-way road on the right a producer is a producer a consumer is a consumer and never the twain shall meet but with DERs and digitization, it creates the opportunity for a whole lot of different institutional and architectural opportunity possibilities because of the technological change. It also creates a whole bunch of different kinds of value creation, both economic and environmental, because a lot of these new resources are lower in carbon and easier to interconnect and um, all sorts of other environmental things that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but our focus in this work is, is the idea of transactive energy as a system design concept. And our goal here is to enable decentralized coordination among all of these new diverse elements. Whereas before, you know, in a traditional electric power network, the, the um, control room operator, the engineer that's in the control room is basically controlling the system. It's very hierarchical. What we're proposing is to use markets to enable decentralized coordination in this increasingly complex network. And so clearly, I mean, to me, this is first and foremost a governance challenge. And, and so that's one reason why I'm interested in hearing your comments. Um, let me give you a more concrete example because this can be a little abstract unless you're kind of deep in the weeds of electricity engineering. Um, in California right now, there is for, and, and there are a lot of policy reasons for this, but uh, there's increasingly a um, distributed residential rooftop solar photovoltaic. So people are putting solar PV on top of their houses. And there are a lot of reasons for that. 
But the system-wide effects of that in California are what's known as the duck curve. And the duck curve is here on the left that you know back in 2012, before all the solar was built out, um, that the, the way, the, the amount of, gener of, it's called load, right? The amount of load over the course of the day kind of fluctuated, went up in the middle of the day, went a little bit down, went up when people came home from work and then went down when they went to sleep. Now with increasing distributed solar, people are using their solar panels to provide um, power for their homes. And as there's more and more and more solar in the middle of the day, that kind of 12 to four o'clock period, the amount of generation that's required from traditional resources is really dipping. But then what happens when the sun goes down at like six o'clock, all of those old traditional conventional sources have to come back on really quickly to serve people who wanna be able to cook dinner and take a shower and watch TV and so on. And that problem is called ramping. The idea that that these, you know, these these um, central large scale generators have to be able to turn back on very quickly, and that's hard and it's costly. Um, so, so an example of the kind of coordination that we are working on is um, illustrated by this idea of coordinating electric vehicle charging with solar PV production, right? Because if you look at the duck curve, or at least when I look at the duck curve, the first thing I say is, well, how come no one in California has put in place a way to coordinate the signal so that EVs charge, electric vehicles charge when the solar is producing, right? Because then you don't have that duck curve problem. You have something else that's taking all of that solar. And uh, our proposal is to use markets to do that kind of coordination. Um, and this, this design concept is called transactive energy. And what transactive energy does is, as I mentioned before, you take power systems engineering, economics and computer engineering, and you synthesize them. And our, our take on this, when we first initially did this back in 2006, we were just thinking in terms of managing capacity and improving capacity utilization in the wires network. But increasingly now with DERs and solar and, and all of the, the decentralized um, resources, in, it's even more become about the increasing coordination of all of these different resources across time and space. And so the idea is that you, you use automation to get devices to exchange with each other using a market process. And um, the market process that we're going to use is going to be familiar to any of you who have ever done a, a Vernon Smith style double auction experiment, because that's exactly what we use. And the idea is that, you know, so for example, in the PVEV charging, right, when that when the solar panels are really coming in hot, literally, <laughs> during the middle of the day, uh, think of what that would do in a market that would shift out the supply curve, it would increase the supply of power that's available in the market, and that would drive down the equilibrium price. And if you have an electric vehicle and you've programmed your electric vehicle to have a trigger price so that when the price goes below some X, charge my battery then when that supply curve is shifting out because of the increased solar, that's going to drive that price down. And for, you know, as, as, it, goes below, as it goes below people's trigger prices, then it will, you know, the, the, essentially the EV will buy that solar power and use it to charge the battery. And so we coordinate this way using the market process and the coordination signal is that price signal, the price signal that is an emergent phenomenon out of the market process. And so what that means is that the signal you get reflects relative preferences and reflects scarcity in that time period. So it's going to be really flexible and really adaptable. A quick clarifying question, Lynn. Uh, Larry sure. White actually dove in in the chat saying, so now I need a charging station at work. So is there some locational questions about your points of access to the distributed um, grid? Yes, um, that is, and, and actually charging stations at work are some of the 
are some of the first places where these kind of investments are being made is, is exactly that kind of, that kind of thinking. And, um, and there you can imagine, and this is where I will put on my coast hat in addition to my, uh, in addition to my Vernon Smith hat and say, you can imagine all of the different kinds of contracts that could emerge to think about, you know, if I'm an employee and there's charging opportunities at work and I benefit from being able to charge at work, you know, how, how do we, how do we work that into the, the kind of compensation arrangements that we have contractually? So yes, Larry, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, in addition to obviously the plug that you're going to have in the garage at home. Um, and there I think it's, it's more straightforward. The idea is you're going to have, you know, in, imagine a home where you have solar on the roof, you own an electric vehicle in the garage, and uh, you have a home energy, you have a home network that all of your, you know, entertainment and stuff is on. And uh, you will be able to um, use your home energy network as a home energy management system and you can basically assign prices to all of the, the devices that you have. Um, so your, your solar, you would assign a price at which you're willing to sell the solar off of your panels. Um, your thermostat, you assign a price at which you're willing to pay to buy electricity for your air conditioning and so on. Yep. And Lynn, a related question surrounds the source of the electricity. I'm not in the fantasy land that thinks we can RFID tag a current, but <laughs> could you, could you in theory, you know, limit the sources that your electricity came from if you had amounts in aggregate that were generated from the various sources in a particular market? So if I wanted to be totally solar or totally coal, and both were available in that market, would I have, is that something that could be programmed in? I think the, um, yeah, and, and there are a couple of, of important governance related points in that. Number one, uh, and this is thinking back to the initial, right, the initial kind of old school electric power network as a one-way flow. It's also, um, you know, the, the distribution grid is a common pool resource. Right. And it is it is that by physical necessity, because in an alternating current grid, you know, uh, you just push you push current and it flows along the path of least resistance. So if if Eric and I want to engage in a transaction, I can't necessarily say, OK, here are my electrons and I'm going to send those to Eric. That's not how this works. And so. At, at kind of an Eleanor Ostrom level, everything that we do in terms of governance in the electric power network is some kind of governance over determining use rights. Because this ability to fully define property rights within the distribution grid is, is impossible. Um, the, and Eric, I think the direct answer to your question is actually more of a software engineering question that when you do the market design, one of the ways that you specify the characteristics of whatever it is you're selling is, you know, because usually we think in terms of price and quantity, but you can also specify characteristics. And that's easy enough to put in the, the XML code that you feed into the algorithms, right? And so one of the characteristics you can put in is that green gray mix, right? So I want 100% green in this transaction, or I want as much green as I can afford. Um, so, you know, tell me what the bids are and tell me how much green is available. And then I've programmed my device to make that decision of whether or not to do that. No, that's really cool. And I definitely, in my head, had a, like a backroom clearinghouse as opposed to uh, my green unit of electricity that came from Lynn. I'm, I'm not that well versed in electricity, but I'm sufficiently well versed to know how silly that sounds. <laughs> cool. So the idea is to take to take this, this very market process oriented prices as emergent phenomena concept and to think about the price signal, the set of price signals that you get in the system as control, vices, control signals for the digital devices. And increasingly the energy devices are themselves going to be digital devices. And so in transactive energy, what we do is we think about using the price signals to control devices using automated directions. Uh, and I'll give you a concrete example here in a second. 
Um, and so this is where, you know, and this is, I guess, my, my Hayekian point for the day is that the price signals are what gives you some indication of the dispersed private knowledge of all of the users in the distribution grid. And through their response to prices, out of that emerges a price signal, the market clearing price, and that provides some information about that diffuse knowledge. And what that information does is it enables intertemporal coordination, it enables spatial coordination, and it enables flexibility through feedback effects as environments change over time, as people's preferences change and constraints change. So let me give you a couple of concrete examples for just a few minutes. Um, the first is on the left in 2006, and this is when, when Dave and I, this is the first time that we collaborated on develop these, developing these ideas of transactive energy from a market design perspective. Um, we were involved in a project called the Gridwise Olympic Peninsula Testbed Demonstration Project. And this was a field experiment with 130 households and there were two, basically two questions that we were asking. Um, all of the households had programmable two-way communicating thermostats. And so they could be programmed to receive a price signal and change their setting if they have to. Um, and so, so for example, and the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the market logic is pretty straightforward. Say you program your thermostat and you set a trigger price and you say, I'm not willing to pay above this price for, you know, for my electricity to run, to, you know, to run the devices on my thermostat. And so in a market period, if the market, you know, and so all the thermostats are submitting bids for how much they're willing to pay. And of course, different people have different preferences. So different thermostats are submitting different bids. Then there's a bunch of supply resources that are submitting offers. And so the real time market that we constructed was constructed as a double auction, where in every market period, the thermostats were submitting their bids, the supply resources were submitting their offers. And this was basically, you know, some distributed generation resources uh, out in the Olympic Peninsula, as well as a, a kind of wholesale bulk supply. So you have a supply curve, you construct the demand curve out of the responsive thermostats, get a market clearing price, any thermostat that wasn't programmed to pay at least the market clearing price had to change its setting. And so you send it back a signal to say, you need to change your setting. And this is where the engineers get all happy and have to figure out, okay, how do we tell it, you know, what do we tell it to do? And that's where the control theory comes in. Uh, then the second part of the, that question was, we took those 130 households with the technology and we split them into contract treatments. And one of the contract treatments was the real-time market that I just described. Um, and uh, fast forward to today, and we've, uh, <laughs> Dave and I have gotten the band back together. Dave's gotten the band back together to his credit. And, um, and we are working on a project called TEST, the Transactive Energy Services System. Um, our industry partner is Holy Cross Energy in Colorado. And, the, the landscape now looks very different. And so in the schematic on the right, you can see that we have a schematic here of a market period. And uh, on the supply resources, what we've basically got is there's the, the solar PV units and they come in at a marginal cost of pretty much zero, right? You know, the, the average cost of solar is not zero, but the marginal cost is. And so they come in at zero. And so when the solar units are, are firing, when, when the solar is producing, you want to use that because that's your, your lowest marginal cost units. But then we have to start thinking about, and, and this is work that's to be done um, by us and others, how do the batteries behave, you know, the electric vehicles or other batteries behave because they're a supply resource, but where they are on the supply curve will depend on their state of charge, um, how soon do you want to go driving? Are you really willing to supply your energy to someone else? Um, and then, of course, on the on the demand side are the responsive thermostats, and um, you know, and and also on the demand side could be your electric vehicle in the times when you want to charge it, because right? then you have to buy the power to do so. Uh, and then what 
what um, Dave and the, the control theory folks do is they come up with the relationship between the market outcomes in any market period and the thermostat settings. This is an example of just a thermostat uh, in terms of how does, if you're, if you are told that you have to change your setting because you weren't willing to pay the market price, what does that imply in terms of what happens to the temperature setting on your thermostat? Right, and so that's where the engineering comes in. So this is probably a good time to pause because that's kind of techy. And Dave, you can tell me if I've gotten anything egregiously wrong. No, we're good so far. <laughs> awesome. When, you teach me well. I have a quick sort of just clarifying question. So these units, in terms of their installation in a home, is it easily retrofitted? Are we talking about a world where new constructions are getting this type of technology? Um, it, it, I was recently visiting a home that still had mainly no, no grounded plugs, but grounded <laughs> plugs in its kitchen and bathroom, which meant I could date that uh, house between probably 1961 and 1971. And so I guess what it, it just some practical aspects around the devices required to bring this type of grid vision to life. Um, I yeah. might run to my co-author and say, Dave, you want to take that? Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question. Um, so when we did this demonstration in 2006, um, the programmable thermostats that we were using were available on the market and it was a fairly simple matter to make them do what we wanted. Fast forward to today and what we've discovered is that a lot of the companies that make these programmable thermostats now have business models that depend on the data coming from those thermostats. And they're very protective about um, what people do with the thermostats and whether they can even access them. So for example, um, Nest um, initially allowed us access to the internals of the thermostat. And so we could do all of this. And um, about a year ago, they turned off all of the capabilities that enabled this. Uh, because their business model depended on their use of that data. And so we found ourselves, at least with that particular thermostat brand, unable to do what we want. Um, other companies have not yet, not yet, and hopefully will not go down that path. Um, but, um, you know, that is, I think that's, that's an issue um, mm -hmm. that we're going to have to think about. Um, and at some point, the question of whether they're going to emerge from all of this work standards um, uh, for how um, this kind of access is um, implemented, um, is that's going to be a question that we're going to have to deal with. And there are ways. There are ways to do it. So, like for example, you could take. I have an Ecobee in in my condo in Chicago, and you know you could do a front end of if this then that, and find some way to connect. And I know Comed has set up a protocol to take the real time, I'm on their residential real time price contract and to take that price and feed it through with this then that and connect it to, to my thermostat. But, you know, as much as I love doing this kind of stuff, I'm not interested in doing that in my own home on my own time. And so it would be really great if we had competitive retail markets where a third party retail service provider would come to me and offer to do my if this then that for me. Right, because then I think we could get around these proprietary, these kind of proprietary standards. And obviously the more, the more you promulgate a culture of interoperability and open standards, um, the, the more likely that is to develop. And I think there's a big ish fight brewing with respect to users ability to maintain their own physical property. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've seen the end of that particular fight yet. I, I'd like to think we haven't, but uh, it may be John Deere one with all permanence um, in, in the sense that how, how expansive that precedent is might actually be problematic. But it, it, I'd like to believe in a world where we have some ability to work on our devices after we've received them in our own hands. But I, I would extend what you said to our digital property as well. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, the current um, 
landscape is such that people are willing to give away their digital information for the privilege of receiving a more targeted advertising. And so we know what, we know what our digital information is worth um, based on behavior of the consumers today. Um, I, you know, part of what we're interested in um, exploring is mechanisms that will allow people to, um, to obtain the true value or something more approaching the true value of their digital uh, information. Um, and I think that would allow companies like Nest to reconsider their business models because um, they might find that the, uh, the transaction with the customer is more profitable than the transaction with the advertiser. Yeah. That makes good sense. We have a interesting and highly relevant question in the, in the chat, which is, do you know how many or maybe what percent of residential markets offer real-time pricing and or net metering? Net metering is pretty common. I would say net metering is, is I would say probably 70% of the customers in the country have some kind of net metering available to them. Um, in Texas, Texas is, and I, I will say, you know, wearing my heart on my sleeve, I am a, in addition to being analytically moved by the Texas model, I am a full advocate of the Texas model. Texas is the one state in the country that has done a full deregulation and fully unbundled their generation, their distribution and transmission wires and retail service provision. And so they don't have, in Texas, they don't have a net metering law, but what they have seen evolve as a course of the deregulation is that those retailers are offering what amounts to net metering contracts and, and they're doing so profitably to residential customers. Um, Real-time pricing is much more rare. The, the one I'm on in, in the ComEd district in Chicago is, is unusual. The more standard approach for regulated rate design is, is right now moving towards time of use as a default rate. And so time of use is a peak and off peak rate structure. But that's really within the regulated, um, the regulated environment. One of the more, and I'm gonna call this a, one of the more pink haired punk uh, aspects <laughs> of what we're doing here is the extent to which a transactive system like this can be a substitute for net metering. Because what this implies is that if you have a portfolio of local energy markets, right? Markets for energy, um, markets for, there's all kinds of grid services that need to happen in order for you to get energy delivered to you. You need voltage regulation and frequency regulation and all this other techie engineering stuff. Those are all services that the more you have these distributed decentralized resources, they can actually provide them. And the, the digital network is what enables them to come together uh, and form markets. And, uh, and so, so I really see transactive energy as a potentially profitable and appealing alternative to net metering. Um, but real-time pricing is, is, not very, is not very widely available yet. Yeah. The other thing I would, I would add um, to that is that the ComEd real-time price is actually a day ahead price. Um, it's not a real-time price in the sense that, that we mean it in the transactive system where the price is discovered um, immediately before um, it goes into effect. And by immediate, I mean seconds um, rather than a day ahead price um, that is revealed or computed and revealed by the um, by the utility and so um, <laughs> and so that you know that price emerges from the bids directly and it doesn't come from the utility um, as it's trying to um, to you know resolve some particular uh, constraint or something uh, okay. and from a controls perspective that has significant implications um, it, it affects what's called stability um, because of the delay in the feedback mechanism. Um, and it has um, a lot of um, uh, significance when you calculate the, uh, you know, whether the market price signal is going to result in oscillations and other kinds of behavior that is um, undesirable from a controls perspective. Yeah. Although I, I will say the, the day ahead real time price design has its roots in Chicago in a, in a really great project um, where they did, um, 
a, a day ahead pilot, day ahead real time pricing pilot without any technology whatsoever. So even though what we're talking about here is automation, um, you know, it's entirely possible to do the kind of day ahead thing without any technology whatsoever. Um, and my favorite result from that particular pilot was that um, the people who saved the most percentage on their bills were people were low income people living in multi unit apartment buildings. And so, so that, <laughs> that made my little egalitarian heart very happy. So, so um, Lynn, yeah. We've got another question, I had a but we can also table this question to be first in our discussion, depending on how it, it, it syncs with the rest of your presentation, but it surrounds somewhat the political economy of a transition to these, uh, this, this new form of grid and transactive energy that it facilitates. Can, can we table that? Because I think yeah. that would be a really fruitful conversation to have. And that was one that I was going to ask as well. So we will, yeah. we will return to that when, you are, when you're through right. your slides. All right. Let me, yeah, let me chug through a little bit more just to give you some more grist for the mill. Um, and then we can keep going. So what we're, what we're trying to do in this paper is, is build on that, that's, that's the foundation. And what we're trying to do here is build on the, the fact that um, over the past 15 years since we started doing this, there's been a ton of work on the kind of engineering guts of the architecture and the devices and getting the devices to talk to each other and to take the prices. And, but there's not been a lot of market design and transactive energy remains very under theorized, both in terms of the engineering theory that Dave works on, but, but particularly in terms of the economic theory. Uh, it's extremely under theorized. And so what we've started to do is basically do a literature review within economics of what are the relevant literatures that form transactive energy economics. And out of that, we're gonna then combine that with control theory to, and, and we are seeing it really start to yield a new approach to market design for this future that we're seeing that is high renewables, high DERs, very diverse heterogeneous um, network, as opposed to the more straightforward network that there used to be before. So what's really, this is super preliminary work in progress. And what's missing and where you can help is that um, is the real governance aspects because, and you'll be able to tell from how I talk about this, that I have institutional and organizational economics in mind, and I have, you know, Coase and Ostrom and so on in mind. And I think what we're going to do is we have a paper that this is going to turn into and then want to write a companion paper focusing on the governance aspects. Um, uh, and so I've already said this, but I really want to hammer this point home that because what we're trying to do is we're trying to cross talk between engineering and economics. And we're finding we even have to change notation and explain our notation really well since, <laughs> since we use different notation. But, um, but that in economics, the coordination function of the price system is what we're using in an engineering context to provide the control signals to the devices. Right, so at a, at a minimum, that's the, that's the proposition that we're making. Um, within transactive energy economics, I think it comprises five different fields in economics. Uh, obviously, we're gonna start with kind of price theory and market process theory, which I've already alluded to. Um, it's an auction of some sort or another. So auction theory and its companion field mechanism design will be very important. Uh, institutional and transaction cost economics is fundamental here. And uh, I should say the, the origin story of transactive energy market design is very much in experimental economics because I think what happened was Vernon and I went out to Pacific Northwest National Lab and gave a, and, and gave a seminar where we ran everyone through a double auction experiment. And Dave and some others were like, you know, light bulb, hey, <laughs> this is how we can do what we want to do. And, you know, the rest is history. Um, so, so experimental economics plays a very important role. And I'm just going to run really quickly through each of these five. Uh, I'm going to assume that, that you're all familiar with some or all of these fields. Uh, so I want to start with, 
what I'm calling market process theory, but I'm really thinking of this as a synthesis of price theory and the kind of Austrian Hayekian epistemology of prices. That um, you know, the standard market model is really the foundation of what we're talking about, right? The devices that want to buy uh, submit bids, the devices that want to sell submit offers, uh, and then they are put together within a market institutional framework and they exchange. Uh, and the exchange yields consumer and producer surplus, which is the blue sideways ziggurat over there on the right. Um, but the epistemology here is fundamental. And this is a real, a real insight for economists to bring to the engineers, this idea that, that um, the knowledge content of each of the individuals who are operating and programming the devices that, that that knowledge content matters and that that knowledge content is part of the value creation from market exchange because of subjectivism, subjective preferences. Much of, in, in this industry, much of the approach to, to even to markets is very cost driven, right? So we see costs as something we can observe, right? And, and so it, that's very much the engineering approach and it ignores subjective value and it ignores subjective opportunity costs. And so part of what we are doing here is reintroducing that into, into the mix. Uh, the second of the, the five fields of economics here is the institutional and transaction cost economics. Um, you can already tell from the way I've described how this is gonna work that um, you know, market exchange always takes place within an institutional framework and part of that is organic and emergent and part of that is designed. And we work very much on the designed part, number one. And number two, taking a page out of Ronald Coase's book, one way that we always conceptualize the digitization that's going on in the network is that digital technologies are transaction cost reducers. So for example, I mentioned before that um, that there are all these grid services like voltage and frequency regulation that you need in order for delivery of energy. And um, historically in the old electromechanical um, utility, vertically integrated utility, the utility owned all of those assets and they were all connected to each other. And it was the connection between them that basically in, in some cases provides the, the grid service, but they were really the only ones who had the assets that could provide the grid service. But now between having these distributed resources and having digital technologies to enable markets and to enable the interconnection of them together, we can now have grid services provided by these distributed resources through markets. And so that's the sense in which digital technologies are transaction cost reducers. Uh, I'm going to mush together auction theory and mechanism design and give a big shout out for our Nobel laureates this year. Um, so the timing of the Nobel couldn't be better for us because um, uh, the number of times that I've cited Milgram and Wilson in, in, in the stuff that we're working on is, is large. Um, and so, so very much if we're thinking in terms of this, this institute, this designed institutional framework. And so we're trying to design these market institutions. Um, and, and so we're taking a lot of insight from auction theory and mechanism design, clearly trying to maximize total surplus subject to individual rationality and incentive compatibility constraints. And as Dave alluded to earlier, trying to elicit truthful preferences through a decentralized price system rather than um, some of the alternatives that we've seen uh, historically in, in utility regulated rate design. Um, and then I just put the function, the, the formulas here for incentive compatibility and individual rationality, just to remind you how that works. This is a map of the spectrum, the spectrum, the frequency allocation in the United States, um, which I will say full disclosure was in this set of slides before the Nobel. So. I was right there. <laughs> um, and then of course, finally, the, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for experimental economics. 
and really the origins of Vernon Smith's double auction test in 1962. But the, the framework both of thinking about the market design, but then also how we proceed with our research is very much the, you know, the, the kind of experiment and treatments, you know, think about an environment and, and ha you have an environment, you have an institution, and you have different treatments where you test either changes in the environment or changes in the institution to see whether they generate different outcomes. Uh, and so we are very much taking an experimental approach to market design here. Um, on the control theory front, uh, and I will, I will let Dave chime in on this uh, probably in, in the discussion, so I know we're, we're running short on time because we've been having great discussions so far. But from the control theory side, um, we are looking to integrate, as I said, the price signals as the control signals. And, and so a simple example of this is the thermostat that I mentioned, the, the two-way thermostat, which is a closed, is single closed loop control. <laughs> and, um, and so we have inputs that go into, into that control, the temperature, desired temperature and the temperature setting. And this is gonna give us an output Q, which tells us how much energy we need to use to do that. And that's going to be an input to a bid in the market. Um, there we go. Now, the, the interesting thing that, that Dave and I are, are noodling on at the moment is that um, increasingly these resources, and I mentioned it with the photovoltaic, these resources are zero marginal cost, a lot of them. The wind and energy are zero marginal cost resources. Uh, although they're not zero average cost, but they're zero marginal cost. And so the way current wholesale power markets are designed is they're designed to be energy markets where you sell an, a, you know, a, a kilowatt or a megawatts worth of power for an hour. So that's going to be your megawatt hour you sell, but it's delineated in terms of a quantity of, of um, energy and uh, the problem is that with that design, as we get more and more wind and solar, the marginal cost goes to zero in those markets. And this has become really financially challenging, especially for nuclear power plants, which in Illinois are closing or are lobbying the legislature for subsidies. So, um, you know, the, that, that challenge of zero marginal cost energy is going to be an issue. And in me, as an economist, it prompts the question of, well, if energy is not really going to be what's scarce at the margin, and I don't think it will be, what's going to be scarce at the margin? And I think what's going to be scarce at the margin is this ability to be flexible, this ability to change up and down, change your settings. And so one thing we're playing around with is, do we need to think about different kinds of market design other than these traditional um, energy market designs. And the control theory is part of what, what gets to that from, from Dave's work that, um, you know, an energy device can take three different actions, consumer produce power, ramp up or ramp down, and either store or release energy. And that these are mathematically related and, and Dave's using um, control theory to model them and this is giving us some implications for the fact that we might actually want to have a market for power, a market for that, that quick time ramping, and a market for storage. Um, but we haven't fleshed those out yet. Um, hey, Lynn, yep. for the uninitiated, myself included, could I get a, a slightly more uh, beginner's definition of ramping up and ramping down? Um, yeah, so, so think of it as the speed with which you can fire up your generator. Yeah, so it's, it's literally the derivative with respect to time. It's how fast can you turn that sucker on and, and get and push that current. Or if it's, or if it's a storage, it's how much, how fast can you turn that sucker on and take the excess, the excess energy that's out there that needs somewhere to go. Um, the, what we're, what we want to do is really synthesize these to inform market design, 
as I said, we've been really using a double auction to this point. Um, there are a couple of different ways you can do a double auction, either the time delimited clock auction. So like the, the one we did in the Olympic Peninsula, the market period was five minutes. Uh, and that was pretty aggressive. <laughs> um, then there's also a continuous double auction where you keep an order book, which is very much like financial markets are. And so we're, we're toying around with those. Um, oh no, my duck curve image is gone, but you saw the duck curve before. Uh, as I suggested, the, um, we're, we're synthesizing, we want to build this theoretical framework for the transactive energy economics, synthesize it with the PID control theory, and, and use that to think about um, market design for enabling this coordination to do things like solve that duck curve problem that I mentioned before. Um, I'm going to stop here because I know we've got good discussion that we can have. Uh, and this pretty much just summarizes everything I just said. Um, this is, as I said, this is very much work in progress. And so we are working both on a more formal model and a simulation based on that formal model, but also want to make sure that we get the, the good conceptual framework right uh, in the process. Awesome, thank you. No, this, is, uh, this has both been informative, but uh, exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to living more in a world where this, where this is possible. Um, and I've, I've obviously, I've seen some of this work before, Lynn, since you and I talked about it pre-COVID times in, uh, at that IEEE event and what now seems like that wasn't even a year ago, but it, it, was, it was like so long ago, it was before you even moved to Denver. But we kind of had two interesting questions burble up in the chat. The one that I said I would give immediate preference, but that one's such a big question that I actually want to nudge a, a discussion that was had between Martin and Larry surrounding the role of batteries in all of this. And potentially batteries as a source of arbitrage, but just any type of distributed storage. Martin or Larry, feel free to jump in if, if you can frame your question more artfully than I. Yeah, so, um, I mean, there was a question, a little bit of discussion about this. I mean, Tesla does sell a home battery product, which um, if, again, I may be mistaken in this, it might be spent cells from um, cars. But I also have been reading over the years that um, various battery researchers have been doing work on um, other kinds of approaches that are where weight doesn't matter, you know? So for example, one of the ones that I read about, I mean, the rough framing of it goes that, well, let's see, aluminum smelting consumes an awful lot of energy. What if we reverse aluminum smelting to store energy and then we resmelt it or something like this? Apparently this is work done out at MIT. And, you know, you just, you, you know, if, if, if weight isn't an issue, then you can potentially uh, store a lot of this energy really very efficiently. And that seems like it would be a, a natural way to solve some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, buying a Tesla um, battery pack for my wall is not a zero cost item, right? So it increases my capital cost. And so, um, again, I, I haven't been eager. So, I mean, I have home solar and I have a Tesla and I haven't bought one of these packs, um, partly because my Tesla, my solar doesn't do 100% of my usage. So I don't really see, I'm kind of using the grid as my, as, as my uh, battery in a way, you know, but this is the problem exactly that you're, you're framing up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to talk about what batteries can actually do. Um, and I, you know, if you're thinking about it in terms of an energy market, you're actually limiting um, yourself um, because what you're, the only thing you're doing is you're arbitraging um, your own consumption um, mm. and you're not really providing a substantial amount of grid support because you don't know what the grid actually wants. They're not telling you, right? right? And so if you think about um, what a grid operator wants to be able to do, he wants to be able to signal um, all these resources um, at what level he'd like the storage to be at, at any particular point in time during the day, right? So in the morning, you probably would want to signal um, a little bit in advance of the uh, peak of the day that you want the batteries to be pretty empty because they're mm -hmm. going to have to absorb an enormous amount of energy during the course of the day. And then later in the day, you want to signal to those batteries that they should be, they should be stocked full because you're mm -hmm. going to need it going into the evening. Um, 
And so if you think about what the energy price is signaling, it's not necessarily signaling clearly what is needed at that point in time. So you need a forward market to do that. If you have a separate storage market where um, that runs a little bit more slowly um, relative to the energy market, you can actually provide that signal so that the market operators or the system operators can say, all right, we need so many um, gigawatt hours of energy stored um, by 10, 10 a.m. because we're gonna come in um, to a day with a lot of sun and we need to be able to absorb um, all of that. And we want um, by uh, 6 p.m., we want five times that amount of energy in storage so that we can handle the, the evening peak. And that is, that is independent of the energy prices that are being used to deal with capacity constraints, let's say, um, throughout the system. And it's independent of the ramping prices that are used to signal when resources need to um, you know, feather in or feather out um, mm -hmm. in response to um, short-term changes. So one of, the, one of the key ideas that comes out of the concept of the PID loop is that these markets, these price signals would act over different time horizons. Um, in a PID loop, the integral component acts very slowly, right? The energy storage component. The power component acts sort of on a meso time scale, you know, minutes to maybe an hour. And the ramping component acts very quickly. It's the derivative component of the response. It's fast acting. Um, it operates perhaps in a 30 second uh, time horizon. And so in the resources sort of align themselves to the prices that they respond to based on how quickly they respond and what their capabilities are. So it's not obvious that batteries should be acting in energy markets. It seems like they should be acting in, an, in a storage market, which is the integral of, the, of right. the energy market, which controls power. Yeah, I love the perspective of, of considering this as a, um, an arbitrage, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about the, uh, the, you know, essentially arbitraging the future uh, price of energy, if you have a liquid enough um, energy market, then, then you can do that. I mean, it works in a similar way as, as you know, the, any commodities market where you have, yeah. you know, the speculators coming in and, and arbitraging that. So in a, in a world with a futures market for this afternoon's electricity, exactly, that becomes a better predictor of the afternoon's temperature than the weather report. Uh, yeah, because people put their money where that exactly. <laughs> yeah, you always you can always bet on the money based predictor is better than anything else, right? <laughs> and the place I think the place we're really starting to see this. And, and where I think this is going to play out is Texas, because a Texas has a very uh, low entry barrier, market oriented institutional framework, and B, they are so they they are such a rich wind resource. So there's tons of wind power in Texas, and um, unlike solar, you know, at least solar to a certain extent, solar tends to happen when people are consuming. And so there's a bit of coordination there. Wind often happens at two in the morning in the winter, which is, is not as helpful. And so I think the storage, sol storage wind complementarity in Texas will be where we see this play out. But this is the traditional market design approach. I mean, Larry just nailed it, that what happens is that you learn over time that, okay, when, the conditions look like this, this is when I can make money by offering to store, you know, in my battery. And, but, you know, it, one question that we're toying with is, is there a way to have actual market design, make it possible to do that other than having a futures market? Um, yeah, so one thing I, I noticed someone asked a question about whether uh, wind and solar were, um, Complementary, I think it was. Correlated. Compliments, Correlated. Yeah. Correlated. So there's a very interesting phenomenon. If you have offshore wind, or if your, your wind turbines are near the shoreline, there actually is a correlation. Mm -hmm. um, because what you have is an onshore, offshore breeze that forms when this, uh, the day begins, the sunrise and the sunset, because the difference between uh, land and sea temperatures. Um, and so that's one area where there's actually a strong correlation between the wind and the solar. Um, but otherwise, yeah, Lynn is right. The, the wind is really governed by the weather, weather patterns and there is some correlation, but it's not 
a really strong one that you could sort of design a market around. Um, besides which, I'm not a super big fan of designing a market around anything, any behavior in particular, because that's right. usually going to lead you to places you don't want to be. Yeah. Well, well, so, I mean, for me, it, it, you know, being having done a fair amount of signal processing in my day, having uncorrelated sources is a good thing, right? Because yeah. it allows you to essentially arbitrage across them. And I guess maybe in energy markets is not such a good thing. You know, I guess that, that yeah. was really the, the, what was in the back of my mind with that. Yeah, well, I, should, I should say, and you know, just so that Eric doesn't revoke my uh, futurist card. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, Dave and I have been talking with our with our colleague Mayank Malik about this, but um, you know, the the blockchain applications of this are, I think, pretty straightforward. We blockchain is not necessary to do the stuff that that we're talking about doing. But there are some blockchain use cases that that definitely fit really nicely here. There is a there's kind of a, a sister concept to transactive energy called peer to peer energy. And the idea in peer to peer energy is essentially you get people in a community, say you've got like a neighborhood like a cul-de-sac and that they declare themselves to be a microgrid and they're going to trade with each other. Um, and that I think a, a blockchain, you know, a blockchain platform is is pretty helpful for keeping track of, of the transactions. So, I mean, that that kind of idea is actually being played out in, you know, especially in California. I happened to be on a trip last year with a, a man who was building these kinds of um, geothermal types of things. They do deep wells for neighborhoods, and um, and and it it makes sense. You know, the, you can if you aggregate the cost across a number of homes, it makes a lot of sense. And I invited my blockchain <clears throat> students to say, "Hey, this is a market where proposed blockchain applications have occurred, but they're being tested on how well they can suss out the tractability of a particular technology to the actual challenges being faced by a particular market." And so, at a minimum, I would imagine maybe some role in decentralized information processing for like especially new grids in in smaller locations i can see that but it raises an interesting question that i think gets at some of the transition challenges that we heard in the chat from uh, nathan the pseudonymless in the uh, mm -hmm. in the zoom world um surrounding what's the political economy of this look like but also like what is the optimal grid size and what is the optimal grid given the grid we've got? I see those as two very different questions because of the very real and lurking aspects of transition costs. I kind of gestured in that direction with the ungrounded plugs earlier, but I'm asking it more directly now, which is sort of how do we, do we incrementally transition to this world? Do we get a new infrastructure bill where we get a president who's like new grid, it's smart and <laughs> it's it back to tomorrow. I mean, what, what are your guys thoughts on these types of transitions? I, I think, well, there, there, there's a whole, I'm, as, a, as a historian of technology as well, um, but also the political economy of this, I think, has to take into account the cultural meaning of the distribution grid for a lot of people. And the idea of electricity as a universal service, and some would even argue electricity as a human right, is going to be an important cultural dimension of how this transition happens. And so I don't think we're gonna have, you know, extreme makeover grid edition happening anytime soon. Oh, <laughs> come on, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also don't think, well, my argument, my argument for doing the kind of stuff that Dave and I work on has been like, you know, over the past five years, the utilities have started to be increasingly nervous about grid defection. Right, the more people are like Martin and have solar on the roof and a PV and a battery in the garage, the more they can go off grid. And if they go off grid, then who's going to pay all those fixed costs for all the assets? And and so my argument to to the utilities has been, if you don't want your customers to leave, maybe you should provide them with services that they value. And you know they used to just value kind of plain vanilla. My light goes on, my light goes off. But now, you know, this is a different world, and this is a digitally enabled world. Um, 
one of the things that you can do to provide your, your customers with value is if you are like Martin and you have these resources, give them an opportunity to trade with each other so that they can earn some revenue to pay off those loans for putting the PV on the roof. Um, you know, give them opportunities to create value. And some of them are going to want that and some aren't because, you know, some people just don't want to, just don't want to have to think that hard about their energy, but other people are going to be, are going to be interested in at least automating some participation. And so as the costs for doing that fall, we should incorporate that. But I think the biggest transition is gonna to have to be if we're gonna continue being connected to the grid and getting the benefits of the grid is that we have to invest in the two-way flow, enabling the two-way flow in the distribution grid. Um, so um, I don't, again, I don't mean to co-opt this conversation, so excuse me for that. Um, but in, in the telecom world, in the world of uh, especially fixed line telephony, they've been dealing with this problem of bit of grid abandonment now for the last um, decade or more, right? Because, uh, I mean, I like to ask my students who, who has a landline anymore and, <laughs> and so, you know, usually you get a few people raise their hands and I ask them if they actually purchased it. And then you know, you kind of get the true confession. No, this is my grandmother's and my parents' line, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it used to be the opposite. It, I wish I'd kept statistics because it would have been pretty interesting. But, but nonetheless, I mean, the telephone companies, fixed line telcos have exactly this problem. And they're going to the PUCs to ask for rate relief or for all kinds of ways in which they can decommission the lines. And in, 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 you know, wealthy enough areas, the likes of Verizon are putting in their FIO system and and actually disconnecting their copper so that you know a subsequent resident could not get regular old copper service. They'd have to buy bios. Um, some people find that unethical and wrong, but it, you know, just as an illustration of what's happening. And I think the utility companies might be able to learn some lessons from that. Yes. No more pots. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, you know, there's there's the side of me that is somewhat unsympathetic and and to the utilities. Um, about this um, because, well, the, the way I like to say it is um, how much buggy whip subsidies are we giving out right now, do you think, All right? I mean, at some point you just have to say, look, this is just not how we're gonna do it anymore. And yes, you put in a lot of sunk costs and yes, you assumed you were going to have 3% eternal growth, but as an engineer, I can tell you that ain't gonna work. Um, and at some point you just have to admit that you were wrong or that your assumptions were wrong. And then you have to, yep. you have to just stop. And, and, and you know, the telcos are the telcos with their, their mm -hmm. copper wires are going to have to basically admit that they were their Their model is done. And the only question they have is what, whether or not they have a new model to replace the old one and how they're going to implement it. And it's not trying to keep the old one alive. that's going to solve any problems. And I think and you're not, that's yeah. part of the political economy of this is very much, I mean, I had a utility executive because I, I gave a presentation about transactive energy and, you know, moving to markets and, and having the utility, the regulated distribution utility become a platform, you know, basically a distribution system operator platform and to facilitate all of these market transactions. And what he said to me was, we would love to do that if we could get our rate of guaranteed rate of return doing that. <laughs> no. and, and, and I will say this, right? I mean, part of, part of me um, recognizes that the transition takes a long time and that there are going to be consumer incumbents who are going to be adversely affected because they're going to be latecomers to whatever that new model is. And in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the things that concern me about transactive have to do with equity and fairness of access, right? Because if you think about the technology that is required to make this work, this is technology that at least in the near term is costly. And so what you're doing is you're creating an environment that rewards people who can't afford to make the investments um, in that technology with, um, um, uh, money essentially that's taken from those who can't afford it, right? 
because you think about it, right? The people who stay on the system pay for the infrastructure and they pay more and more of their share of the infrastructure while we reward people for leaving. And that's probably not the right model. Um, so the question is how do we construct a, a utility business model around transactive that allows us to make that transition smoothly without disrupting the um, utilities model and without disrupting the uh, consumers that are trailing in, in that transition because either they can't afford to or are simply not interested in participating um, you know, for whatever reason. It, it doesn't really matter what the reason is. Um, well, and and as, I, I struggle with that. As Nathan says in the comments that you know, we need to include a bailout to overcome the transitional gains trap to relieve utilities, this is exactly what happened in the 1990s with restructuring with the buyout of stranded costs, right? The stranded assets were the generation assets that they said, okay, we invested in these in good faith and now you're changing the rules on us. So we need to be compensated. And then of course they turned around and then they sold them to independent generators. And so they basically got to double dip, which is fine. But- um, Well, but it wasn't fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the equity, on the equity point, uh, also the this test project that Dave is leading up um, that we're doing with Holy Cross Energy, I think it's an interesting model because what they're doing is um, Holy Cross Energy is partnering with some other organizations, including Habitat for Humanity, to build affordable housing in basalt, um, which and, you know the the Roaring Fork Valley is super expensive because it's lovely and and Aspen drives up prices for everyone. But um, so we are working, they've teched out these new uh, affordable homes and, and that's where, you know, that's where we're working on working out some of these, some of these uh, models. I guess I'll kind of return to a question that, uh, Nathaniel Snow um, of Ball State Econ, we got a little additional information in the, uh, in the chat, um, is I think it's an important one, which is to say in, on some margins, we've heard promising margins that utilities might benefit from some of the potential complementarities in, in you know, arbitraging on ramp times or correlating in terms of when the, when the electricity is actually being generated. But who are the big objectors? Are they the ones with uh, it, it, where we have a transitional gains trap? Or, I mean, I'm looking at the largest electricity utilities in the US and I've given my hard earned money to a lot of them over my many moves, such as Dominion, Duke, <laughs> Exelon. Um, hey, I'm in PG&E territory. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, <laughs> Do we need leadership on the part of these companies? Is this a political question where we, we tell them you're getting this payout, this bailout for these transitional issues and we're done with it? I, it, it I'm just kind of curious. That actually might be a better question for Jen than any of the rest of us because <laughs> <laughs> she's sort of the, how do you, how do you shift? How do you shift away from that? Um, I don't know. It's, I mean, it, it it's, uh, it, it usually takes the form of side payments, right? It usually takes the form of side payments. Um, because of the structure of the industry, we've got both a federal regulator for inter transactions that cross state lines, but then everything else is at the state level. So it would be like 51 sets of side payments for 51 different regulated utilities plus because there's multiple utilities in each state. Um, and it's not like, although in my dream of dreams, it would be, but it's not like Uber where you can just like show up and start doing your new business model and get people to really like it. And then the incumbent realizes what you're up to and starts complaining, but people already like it. So it's too late, right? It, it's hard to do that given the physical nature of the distribution wires. <laughs> so, um, and I think it's. Well, I think Transitional gains trap is definitely the name of the game. To put a different gloss on it, what's to me potentially quite fascinating about the trans, the specific transition you're describing is it doesn't sound like we're any longer in a network industry world of technological necessity. It's transition costs potentially preventing us from transitioning away from what have sometimes been called natural monopolies. 
the justification for regulating network industries tends to be the fact that the gains to a single provider in a geospatial or other similarly demarcated region are, are so large that we're gonna have a single provider. But in the case of things like water, in the case of things like electrical utilities, having a monopoly and control of those types of things is, is viewed as, as socially pernicious. We don't need to wade into the debate to the, to the extent to which they actually are. But it's, it to me is a, is a rather poignant case study in what happens when your network industry is no longer so tightly networked and monopolistic of technological necessity, but boy, it's enjoying those guaranteed rates of return that were a clumsy institutional fix from a different period. So uh, it, that was a great long-winded comment, but not a, not a great question. Um, it, it, it more just, uh, this is, I think it's an exciting area that, that is ripe for innovation, but we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be diminish the actual transition costs that are, that are there. Um, I, 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 I've, given a, I've given a lot of thought to how I would pitch transactive energy to Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, you know, and there are folks, you know, within the company who are looking at it and, and thinking about that problem. But when you, when you look at the kind of pressures that that company is under already, um, and, and, you know, it's probably a leading uh, company in that sense. I don't think that where they are is going to be unique. Um, I think other companies are going to find themselves in, in other IOUs are going to find themselves in a similar position uh, at some point um, in the future. Um, and so if, you, if you're trying to pitch an idea like this to them, um, they, they have a really tough time figuring out how we get from here to there. They understand that they need to do something. There's no question. Everybody understands that you know, going into bankruptcy a second time is not a good sign. Um, and, uh, but it's not at all clear how this kind of a technology remedies the core problems, the fundamental problems that they're having and the fact that they're getting, you know, massive uh, defection because of um, uh, the the CCAs, you know, the um, what do you call? Aggregators. Yeah, community choice aggregators. That essentially the municipalities have done an end run and are finding a way to uh, capture all their customers from them. And so all PG&E is in the is going to be in the end is just a wires and billing company. Um, and it's really hard to see what the business model for a utility is as an IOU um, when it's just operating a commons. Um, there's really nothing left for them to do. Um, and I think a lot of municipalities are now asking themselves, maybe we just need to buy the assets off them for, you know, whatever they happen to be worth and, and have, you know, have it over with. That's... So again, you know, I mean, there's... There's, <laughs> telecoms can be somewhat instructive in this area too, right? So um, back in the uh, early 90s or so, there was this big push towards the so-called structural separation where they wanted to separate the, uh, the, the, the local loop transmission mm -hmm. facilities from the services provided upon it. And really, and it actually goes back to the divestiture where you know, people said, hey, there's no real business in running a local, ex just a basic local transmission line. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, Judge Green, who whose name is, people in the telecom business know, but who anybody outside of it is, is who, but anyway, he, he basically decided to lump information provision in with it. And in a way that opened a Pandora's box that we've never stop dealing with in telecoms because of this problem. You know, and again, from a, from a public perspective, you wanna make the investment attractive enough so that, you know, you can attract capital into, into the operation, it has to spin off enough cash to make it interesting to investors. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably never gonna be an exciting investment, but if you can provide, you know, uh, uh, capital stability and some, you know, decent dividend, you know, you're going to attract a fair amount of uh, people, let's say in my age group or so, you know, <laughs> looking at, at um, you know, plans, you know, different kinds of investment strategies, let's say, going forward. Um, so it's not impossible, but the question is whether you can do it cost effectively enough, right? So if you're going to provide those kinds of returns to attract the kind of capital you need, 
it may be just too expensive for compared to the alternatives that might be available. Again, I don't know. That's an empirical question, I guess, you know. Yep. And so we have a couple interesting and slightly impenetrable for me comments in the uh, chat from Nathan. So about premature, prematurely instituting a franchise, the risks associated there too. Oh, there is, we've got someone. Nathan, feel free to jump in directly. Um, thanks. Well, I guess what I was just saying that in regards to uh, transitional games traps that emerge out of enfranchisement like this, it's just a warning that we should beware against creating new franchises going forward. Because mm -hmm. it, the, the, the institution of a franchise um, presumes that the market won't come up with a solution itself and, and says, oh, government's got to do something and get ahead of the game on this. And if, if we wait, um, if technology is improving, uh, then we may, the market may provide its own solution. The other, the other thing I, I think is, is I find useful for thinking about these is um, both taking the kind of financial insights from telecom that as Martin articulated them, and then combining that with kind of Dave's PG&E experience to say, um, you know, the, the existing, the way that we're currently doing distribution utilities uh, is not sufficiently flexible to deal with the challenges either of digitization or of climate change. And so, you know, the, the California forest fires and the, you know, PG&E bankruptcy coming out of that, you know, one, if I had to give an elevator pitch for transactive energy, one of my elevator pitches would be Transactive energy is a way to coordinate small scale distributed resources that are more nimble and flexible. And so they can keep the power on even in the WUI, in the wildlife urban interface, or they can be moved around to be moved away from threats. And, and so I think the, the combination of those for me means that we need to be thinking very differently about the value propositions and that what we need is we need institutional frameworks that enable the flexibility. And that's why markets are, are a good approach. But then I would also recommend, um, there's a, uh, it's a University of Colorado Silicon Flatirons, University of Colorado Law and Journal of Law and Technology paper from like Jennifer Skies and Adam Thierer and so on, and, but it's about soft law. Mm -hmm. um, and taking soft law approaches to regulation. And essentially it's, it's moving more towards trying to get stakeholder consensus, which sounds like nothing but a recipe for transaction costs. But if you organize it well, and I think Jen probably has more experience doing this kind of thing, certainly than I do. If you organize it well and you get parties to come together to a consensus about move about how to do the transition um you know their paper for me gave had some some ideas for how to do that so we've covered the gamut here eric i know no this has been this has been loads of fun thank you guys i uh it, it and thanks for all the audience participation this has been such a lively discussion i didn't have to dig deep about a topic i know less about than many people in the audience as is already self-evident from the quality of questions um, so does anyone have anything else? Um, this has been, this has been fascinating and I, I, it gives me cause for optimism. I look forward to seeing how I'm going to get electricity in 10 years. Um, hey, you'll get a charge out of it, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't help it. I can't help myself. I'm about to be a dad. So I've been polishing my dad jokes. Um, it, 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 that's, uh, that's strong. I, I have a, I have a book of them, Eric. I'll send them. <laughs> <laughs> well if we don't have anything else i think we can uh, we can sign off we're uh, you know all of four minutes left in our flex time so the discussion has been lively as ever um this was Jen, great you have thank any, you oh, we have to give uh, lynn a round of applause oh, yeah. oh yes thank you lynn <laughs> <laughs>